just to begin and to say some uh, beginning words to everybody. Uh, my name is Ivona Novakowska. I am one of the PhD candidates at our academy and I had the pleasure to co collaborate with uh, the doctoral school in organizing this event. And my pleasure today is to introduce our guest, uh, who is Peter Jonasson. Uh, he's a PhD and a widely known psychologist um, and researcher and author of, uh, I think, uh, over 125 uh, research papers, collaborating with various research teams uh, all around over the world. Um, and his interests are, for instance, um, mating psychology, sex differences, and dark triad traits. Uh, recently, he has moved to Europe to become an associate professor at uh, University of Padova in Italy, and also uh, a visiting uh, professor at uh, Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw. Has accepted our invitation uh, and uh, is here today to talk about dark trial traits um, around the world and it's a an one hour lecture and then we will move on to a workshop <coughs> dedicated to PhD candidates from our academy and then a second lecture will, uh, will come uh, about mating preferences and Peter we are very happy uh, to welcome you in our online zone it's not a face-to-face -face mating, but I'm personally very glad that we can keep our research network uh, going. And on behalf of all the academic community, I'd like to welcome you warmly and now pass the voice to you so we can begin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me uh, virtually. Um, I hope this is uh, not the going to be the future of all academic meetings for the rest of our lives. Uh, I, I've always enjoyed conferences and, and meetings and the drinks that go along with them. Uh, so yes, um, first I want to talk about the dark triad. Uh, I'll try to give you some uh, entertaining stories along the way. Uh, for instance, um, I gave this talk to a biological anthropology department, not this talk, but this title in particular, and no one showed up because they thought I was talking about like the, the triad, like um, uh, a crime, right? Well, one of these triads in Asia, uh, as opposed to the personality traits. So six people showed up. And the people in the room were like, well, you should have called it something else. I'm like, well, sorry. So thankfully, as psychologists, you know a bit more about these traits. I am, you have to be living under a, a proverbial rock to not, um, uh, to not know what these traits are. Uh, I'm working on a psych bulletin paper now uh, trying to show just how, uh, let's call it, popular these traits have become with a guy named Adrian Furman uh, and, and someone else doing a social network analysis. And, and the increase in interest is just uh, it's astronomical compared to other um, uh, topics of interest right now in psychology. So uh, I got in early on the traits, and so it allows me to spend a lot of time with different groups working on these projects. Uh, if you have been under a rock or you happen to study something completely uh, obtuse to personality, um, you might be interested to learn that the dark triad are called psychopathy or composed of psychopathy, which is uh, quintessentially antisocial behavior, impulsivity, limited empathy. Uh, narcissism, which has a, a variety of definitions, and indeed today probably the, the most accepted definition is this two-dimensional view that I've uh, done with Badania and, and uh, her husband Marcin about, about um, vulnerable and grandiose narcissism, but nevertheless, uh, there's this grandiosity to narcissists, there's a sense of entitlement, and there's a, a bit of a, a chest beating, a showing off kind of approach. They want people to pay attention to them because their, their, their view of themselves is often indexed by uh, how other people view them. And lastly, the least well-known is Machiavellianism. I think psychopathism is probably something that everybody learns when they're going through their abnormal psychology classes, for example, but Machiavellianism is a little, what, little, little well less known. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, if I speak too fast, uh, just yell at me. Um, I appreciate that I'm uh, a New Yorker and we can speak a little bit fast uh, for some people. But uh, Machiavellianism, of course, uh, comes from Prince Machiavelli and it characterizes um, a person who is manipulative, who's pragmatic, who's cynical, and those types. And, and these three traits have their own research traditions independently, and they had for many, many years, and indeed, indeed they still do uh, have their own traditions. But when we study them together, we call it the dark triad. Now people say, why do you call it the dark triad? I didn't call it the dark triad. 
Um, uh, people have claimed that if I, if by calling it the dark tribe, we're somehow making the traits seem evil and more nefarious than we, than we need to. Uh, but I, I'm not in charge of that, um, um, that name, and I'm not going to argue with the guy who came up with it. Um, so given this incredible um, last 15 years, 20 years of research on the, the dark triad, we know uh, an incredible amount about these traits, and I have no way of covering uh, all of that information for you now. Um, there's, there's nearly a new study uh, a week that comes out looking at some, some thing in relation to the dark triad. One of the benefits of research on the dark triad is because it has been relatively new, you could almost throw anything you care about at it. So imagine you're interested in, as I know some of you are, right, the, the hostile attribution bias. You could just say, oh, I'm just going to throw the hostile attribution bias at the dark tribe and see what, see what emerges. And, um, and then we, uh, you, you see the patterns that you get. And, and I've seen perfectionism. I've seen all sorts of bizarre things like food preferences, for example. So why, why would you look at food preferences in the dark tribe? Well, at least for these authors, they were a bit like, well, why not? Food is a big portion of people's lives. I and mean, indeed now I think on quarantine, it's the central part of all of our lives. That and the home workouts that we're, some of us are trying to do, uh, which are just you know, losing ground in terms of the battle of the bulge uh, every day. But I wanna give you a summary um, of the big stuff, the stuff that's relevant for us and um, give you a, a, a crash course, as we say in English, on the dark triad traits. So uh, the first, uh, um, fundamental revelation, of course, uh, that linked these traits was simply that they're all disagreeable. These are disagreeable people, both in the colloquial sense of the word, but also in the sense of the big five, right? So the word disagreeableness is not exactly the same in the big five conceptualization as it is in colloquial use, but these people are what you call misanthropes, which is another way of saying disagreeable. And if you want to know what a misanthrope is, uh, just look to the character um, Gregory House. So Gregory House is known to be a misanthrope. If you don't know who Gregory House is, that's from a show called House MD. If you missed that show, you missed out on quite a uh, fun, um, quite a entertaining show. Uh, they're they're dishonest. So in the the Hexaco model, they're linked even more strongly with dishonesty than with disagreeableness. So these are dishonest people. They often lack self-control. Uh, indeed, they also have, at least psychopathy in particular, evidences some degree of ADHD symptomology as well. Uh, this probably comes as no surprise to many of you. Um, they're often associated with limited empathy, although there's some evidence coming out lately that says that their limited empathy is more on the emotional side than the cognitive side. Uh, they understand other people's feelings. They simply, um, if not their default response to, to attend to people's feelings. Uh, and there's even some evidence by me, once you do some uh, uh, partialing procedures, that narcissism might actually be, uh, uh, at least the, re the remainder of narcissism, the residual of narcissism, might be positively associated with empathy. So the lighter sides of narcissism might actually be associated with being an empathetic person. It's just that narcissism has such an overlap with psychopathy and Machiavellianism, which are traits that tend to have limited empathy attached to them. Um, much of my early work was on the social and sexual behavior of these traits. They're associated with um, uh, rape, what, what we're calling rape, uh, rape enabling attitudes. Um, and, and just to uh, take a pause for a second for, for Arthur's sake, uh, every time someone has ticked uh, that they're in the waiting room, I've, I've allowed them to enter. So hopefully that um, um, everybody's in and there's no problems. Uh, but, but they have these dark triad traits are associated with rape enabling attitudes. They're associated with casual sex, um, um, both engaging in it, willingness to do it, desire for it, a greater number of sex partners, and a variety of things like that. Um, they are. Back to the issue of them being misanthropic, they're, they're, they're jerks uh, oftentimes. They're, they're abrasive, they're interpersonally antagonistic, um, they're not very good at getting along with other people, and they often, it often results in conflict in the workplace and conflict in their social and um, romantic lives. They experience uh, schadenfreude and, of course, sadism, as many of you already know. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with schadenfreude, which I imagine most of you are, but just in case, 
Uh, it's the enjoyment of watching someone else uh, suffer. Um, this is something that's very common in uh, Australian culture. They wouldn't call it schadenfreude, but they would say tall poppy syndrome. Uh, there is a, a perverse kind of pleasure in Australians to, to cut down the big guy. Right? They don't like to see anyone get too tall. So if you're too famous, if you're too um, uh, uh, bloated in your self-esteem, for example, they like to, to take you down a couple pegs is the English phrase for it. These are censors. Uh, they enjoy drugs, sex, alcohol, rock and roll, all these kinds of things. And as I mentioned, this list just keeps going and going. So there's a, a, one of the people that's, that's here with us uh, right now, uh, his name's Piotr, he's a student at uh, uh, University of Cardinal Stefan Ryszynski, and we're looking at problematic, um, problematic social media use. Uh, so we, we've already looked at this in, in other ways, but what he's doing is he's looking at it in relation to uh, social media addiction. So not just problematic use, but how people are addicted to social media. So uh, the list keeps growing, growing, and, and I won't lie that I, I, I've been a bit, uh, not jaded, but uh, tired of it. We can just keep doing these studies ad nausea, and it's like, well, what else are we gonna add? What new can we say? And I think one thing that's, uh, clear though is that the the interest just keeps going up, right? And and so more and more people come to it. They keep doing more and more of these what I'll call normal science kind of studies. Uh, normal science is a Thomas Kuhn, a philosopher of science, um, as his uh, terminology. And the data we have now gets us over uh, 1,200 publications uh, with the dark triad traits in them in 2019. And so it just keeps going up and up. And one of the reasons it seems to have caught on pretty strongly is uh, because of the, me identifying these traits with James Bond. And so the typical way that people think about these traits, of course, is that uh, these are evil people, right? All, all the villains on the James Bond episode, movies and all this, are, are assumed to be psychopaths. But, but maybe James Bond is a psychopath too, right? He, he does all these things we've just mentioned. Um, he just happens to do them for the reasons that we consider, or he, he does them for our group. He protects our group with his psychopathy, for example. And, and, and he'd be what we'd call an anti-hero, of course. And now, uh, I use James Bond just because that, I was probably, I think the, when I first mentioned that it was 2008, and that was, I was kind of, you know, waiting for the next James Bond movie probably to come out. Uh, I'm, of course, a James Bond fan, uh, but there's others. Um, uh, here's just another one, but there's, there's thousands of them. Another anti-hero that the whole comedic utility of this character, Bender, if you're familiar with the cartoon Futurama, um, is that he's essentially a, a kind of a dark triad person, a uh, dark triad robot, and everything he does is just what you'd expect. Um, the popularity of these traits has even gotten into the mainstream. There are not just books about it, but there's a show in, in, in America, if you have it here, called Criminal Minds, and they even mention the dark triad. They said, oh, this person that we're pursuing, he's characterized by the dark triad traits. So it's like, what? Yes. So uh, it is, it is, it is uh, what is this, art imitating research in this case. Now, the real reason I think it's worthwhile to study these traits, and the real reason I think that um, the traits became popular is because up until about 2000, the, st the focus of the traits was simply on their, their, them as pathologies. And uh, that's interesting, but that doesn't say anything new about the traits. It doesn't provide a different way of seeing the traits. And so I came along and I said, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm an evolutionary psychologist. Isn't it possible that being a jerk, being, a, being an asshole, right, uh, could potentially be um, adapted, right? It might come with some costs to the person and to the group, but could it be adapted? And of course, I mean adaptive not in the in the clinical definition of the word adaptive, but in the evolutionary word of adaptive, which is, does it provide greater survival and, and more offspring? Yeah? And so, yeah, it could have all kinds of psychosocial costs associated with them, but if they improve your reproductive fitness, just one unit, then, then, then they could have been adaptive over larger evolutionary time, right? So if, if a, someone high on psychopathy produces one more offspring, the genes that are associated with that, that uh, trait um, go on to the next generation. And of course, as uh, the behavioral geneticist Turkenheimer says, first law of behavioral genetics by Turkenheimer is everything is heritable. Right? So um, if psychopathy is heritable, and we know that it is, uh, 
it might be an adaptive strategy. Now, how might it be adaptive? Well, this life history theory gives us an insight to this. It suggests that there might be patterns of how people deal with problems in their lives for solving the two primary problems in biology, which are how to essentially survive somatic effort and how to reproduce. This theory called life history theory was originally applied to species. And so it allowed us to understand, well, what's the difference between, you know, over here we have an elephant and over here we have a, you know, a, a poison arrow uh, tree frog. And, and the, there's obvious differences in size and these types of things, but um, there, there are more telling differences. For instance, the, the years of gestation that a, uh, an elephant goes through are far greater, 24 months uh, relative to the, the, um, the, the, the frog here just immediately pops out babies, so to speak, and makes lots of babies and invests very little in those babies. And we call that kind of species a R selected species. And what they're doing is they're focusing all their time and effort and resources and, and everything on, um, on the, the reproductive effort, the, the mating and the parenting, so making offspring, essentially. And the case selected species, like an elephant, uh, has long gestation periods, has long developmental periods, has strong bonds to family members. So I wasn't the first person to say this, but in, in the 2000s, the early 2000s, People started saying, okay, yeah, there are these, with, there is, there are these um, between species differences, but what about within species differences, right? So can we describe why some individual elephants or some individual people engage in different approaches to the world than others? And so life history theory in the 2000s became something you could apply to individual adjectives. So one of the, the shortcomings of most personality research, and this is including the traditional dark triad research, of course, is that without any theory, you're just simply describing patterns. And that makes it really easy to just throw anything you want at the dark triad, like food preferences, or I've seen a, one study on um, the kinds of avatars that people choose uh, when they're playing video games. So the evolutionary approach allows you given some a priori assumptions about what organisms are uh, functionally designed to do, to ask important questions about uh, adaptive design, as well as um, maladaptive design uh, simultaneously. So to back up my case that these traits might be life history uh, indicators, they might be uh, something you could study within a life history paradigm, I've amassed uh, quite a bit of uh, data We'll have as well. We review it in this uh, study here I cite on the bottom from the Australian Journal of Psychology, but I'll just give you a crash course on these. Men tend to be faster. They tend to be more characterized by our selected traits than women do, and indeed, um, as you'll see in a little while, and I, I can report from all my studies, I can't, I don't know of a single study that has the sex difference reversed, where women are higher, so women are more narcissistic, for example, than men are. Uh, there are times when the sex difference is insignificant. Uh, that, that is most commonly associated with uh, Asian cultures and, um, and narcissism only. Uh, but nevertheless, men tend to both descriptively and statistically all over the world have faster life history strategies and therefore also have um, um, uh, higher scores on the dark triad. If you ask someone on the dark triad, do you want $100 now or $1,000 in a year from now? They uh, statistically, at least, they choose the hundred dollars now. These are people who, who have a mental set that tells them uh, time is short, and so I can't predict the fact that they'll that I'll, I'll be here in a year. Uh, I want that hundred dollars now. I can get that that hedonistic benefit from that hundred dollars now instead of having to wait a year for the thousand. As we've already mentioned, they have a short-term mating bias. They tend to be more interested in short-term mating than long-term mating. This is particularly for psychopathy and Narcissism, uh, when, you, when you look deeper in the data, it's typical that Machiavellianism has no unique mating motivations. The trait doesn't really have a mating uh, bias towards it. It tends to be much more focused on uh, deception and power and things like that. Um, to that regard, these traits are, are associated with manipulation and indeed a manipulative approach to the world dealing with other people is the opposite of a, what's called a slow life history strategy. So cooperators are the people we like, the people that help us, the people who, who edit our papers for us 20 times 
uh, those types of people. The manipulator is someone who would be higher on the dark ride and who has a faster life history strategy. These are quantity over quality people. This is not just uh, in, both in terms of mating, but it's also in terms of their approach to life. You might even see this in publication style. So people who produce lots of low quality research um, could potentially be high on the dark triad. And so their goal is to uh, get as many publications as they can, as opposed to making some substitute contribution, uh, or, as a, or as they're just not willing to wait to accumulate the 30 studies with uh, various samples and various different methods to get into, say, JPSP. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with JPSP. Uh, they're the joke among those who publish in JPSP a lot is you do this, you do five studies with different samples and different methods and experiments and all this, and they come back and they tell you you have to do five more studies. Uh, and it sounds like it's uh, like I'm joking, but um, my many of my friends are obsessed with publishing only in JPSP, and that's their that's the that's the uh, um, one degree of separation information I can report to you. So so, so friends like uh, David Schmidt, for example, um, who's you know the number one cross cultural psychologist in the world, at least by citations, uh, he's just refused to publish in JPSP because of this. He's just like it's just not worth the headaches to have to do this study, and you know five years later maybe you're published, your, your paper is published. These are people who are much more concerned with themselves than other people. Now, I don't think they're always concerned with themselves over other people, but I think in particular, when, uh, when times are tough, I think they prioritize themselves over other people. Uh, um, uh, but when things are great, it's like, yeah, sure, I'm a nice guy. Like, oh, if, you know, everyone can have drinks and food, but because we're all feasting, things are great. But when things get bad, I think these traits are probably very good at uh, organizing people's behavior towards uh, their own self-interest. And that's probably why we, we, in our hearts, kind of um, uh, don't really like these people, because we know that when the chips are down, they're going to uh, betray us, essentially. Uh, these are agentic people. Um, they are much more interested in their own needs, their selfish needs, uh, than they are the group needs. And I think, again, it, it's similar to the self and other uh, dichotomy as well. These are risk takers. These are the people who are probably uh, going for jobs right now during, um, during quarantine. These are the people who are very reluctant to wear the masks. These are the people who are going to, you know, uh, going to shops still and all these types of things. Whereas uh, the people who are low on these traits are the ones who are likely to be staying at home, heeding the advice of the government, the doctors, um, even when that advice maybe doesn't make all that much sense, like the masks, for example. And so, well, I'm just gonna, these are people who probably were wearing masks before we were told to wear masks because they were safety focused. Um, whether or not those masks actually helped, it almost didn't matter is that they, they had a bias, people on the dark tribe will have a bias engaging in behaviors that are safety oriented. Uh, whereas people behind the dark tribe, not so much. And of course, uh, you know, James Bond is a great example of risk taking, for example, as well as um, um, this, this, um, uh, this character here whose name I can't remember from the movie Red Sparrow that uh, Jennifer Lawrence played. Now, as great as this is, one of the, and as, as exhaustive almost as a list of possible things we could talk about, um, one of the things that's underappreciated about evolutionary approaches to not just anything, but personality, uh, is that it's, um, it's an interactionist paradigm. And so uh, evolution psychology is often misconstrued as uh, genetic determinism, for example, or that, it, that every individual member of the species, like they all should be the same, for example. But instead, um, it is one of the few paradigms in psychology that allows you to take both the genetic and the environmental and put them together. Um, and so it says that there are, there are specific ecological circumstances that should um, moderate people's behavior. It's not every kind of potential social psychological manipulation that would matter, but maybe ones about things like pathogens, about risk, about uh, insecurity in finance, being able to find a job, things like that. So these kinds of manipulations uh, have proven to be quite successful, actually, in experimental psychology. Uh, one study, they, they made people think that, um, that uh, their life was going to be short, uh, that they were likely to have a, you know, to die soon, for example. And when asked how many uh, children they wanted and how soon they wanted to have children, people said they wanted uh, more children and they wanted 
uh, catch children sooner when they when they were under threat. And so this is a kind of life history prediction where you where certain contextual factors that might be affecting some but not others uh, amplify the speed of, of people's um, uh, life history strategy. Um, another study that I've done that I've um, with a colleague who's who's uh, not a, for some reason not able to get her, uh, her her act together to publish it, we found that um, as you would expect, most people when presented with uh, pathogens, diseases, pictures of diseases, pictures of rotten meat, will get uh, what's called um, slower. So they'll age in less risk taking, less sexual risk taking, for example, more likely to wear condoms, this type of thing. But when you take people high on psychopathy in particular, and you show them those same images, they do the opposite. So people who are high on psychopathy, when exposed to pathogens, don't slow down like everybody else does. They do the opposite. They speed up. And so the presence of pathogens to individuals who believe the world is, is in bad shape, right, that things are bad, they say, well, as the saying goes, in for a penny, in for a pound. They say, well, I'm just going gonna, gonna to speed up. And so we, we hope to publish this. I hope to publish this. But my, my colleague hasn't really gotten around to this. And so the question then becomes, what about context? What about how people are raised? What are the, you know, um, the governmental policies that might influence the, the composition of, of uh, uh, society? What are the cultural factors that might influence individuals' dark triad scores? And so there's very limited research on this, uh, if I'm honest with you, for a number of reasons, which we can get to in a little bit. Um, and so I'll give you a little bit of what we know already. Uh, so the dark triad traits are associated with um, self-reports, at least, of a harsher and more unpredictable childhood. In particular, the unpredictable one is what really was the strongest in this particular study. Narcissism seems to be associated with uh, what we'll call helicopter momming, but an overly uh, dutiful, an overly uh, uh, smothering even mother, right? A mother who is overly attentive to uh, uh, her, her son's needs in particular. Um, Psychopathy was linked to uh, a lack of fathers for men as well. And this is something I'll come back to in just a minute. And um, there's also some indication that insecure attachment patterns, which uh, are thought to at least arise from the way children interact with their parents. And lastly, uh, in one of the few studies that has actually, that has, uh, actually manipulated context, they found that uh, people high in psychopathy reacted more strongly to physical threats whereas narcissistic people reacted more strongly to ego threats. Now, this is just some list of facts. Uh, why is it even interesting? Why, you know, how does this even, you know, uh, this just kind of reaffirms the, the pathology model of, of, of the dark triad. Well, it's interesting to note that even in elephants, there appears to be something of a psychopathy that goes on when the bull elephants have been, have been killed. And so I'm sure you know that bull elephants have these long, beautiful tusks, and poachers come along and chop them off, and they often kill the, the, bull, the bull elephants as well. And in those um, societies of elephants where there's a shortage because of death of bull elephants, the teenage bull elephants are every bit as bad as you can imagine a teenage, you know, 20 ton animal would be. Just a bully, uh, indeed, they're actually called bull elephants, right? They're being bullies, right? They, they are harassing the females, they're harassing the offspring. When the male, when the bulls, the adult adult males are around, they seem to, you know, smack young ones around a little bit. Not literally, but the presence of these uh, um, uh, adult uh, elephants seems to shift um, the young bull elephant's behavior into being a little bit more well-behaved. So there's clearly something going on about the, the, um, the presence or absence of fathers, both in the animal kingdom and in humans, that might be associated with a behavioral syndrome that we might describe as psychopathy. And I want to um, use this word in, uh, this, uh, for a little bit here. Uh, um, I'm moving to the space that I don't think psychopathy, narcissism, Machiavellianism are personality traits anymore. Uh, I now think that they're behavioral syndromes, which is the output of some internal processes, uh, but that's why, and, and, and in that way, we could say that you know a dolphin has a kind of a personality, an elephant has a kind of a personality, um, 
and, and we could use the words like hopathy uh, instead of having to talk about what are their internal dispositions, uh, which are the harder things to look at. Now, of course, what we have done with context, and it's very limited, uh, has been mostly um, uh, limited to weird samples, right? Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Uh, and I know that um, you tend to consider Poland to not be fully weird because uh, it's not fully Western, I guess. Uh, but but this is my fourth time here. I, I don't find uh, Poland to be all that different. You have uh, you have better Wi-Fi than Australia does. I'll tell you that uh, the speed of Wi-Fi here is tremendous compared to what I had in Australia. Um, but the point being is that almost everything we know about personality, about social psychology in particular, but in social psychology proper, comes from in particular the US, but also in Western Europe. And many of it, much of this has to do with you know, um, income differences across these countries where uh, because of Western Europe and America being wealthier, they could invest in these kinds of intellectual endeavors where other countries were trying to survive. Uh, I, of course here, you know, you, you know, it wasn't long ago before, you know, you know, this was this whole city was ravaged by, by World War II and, and the Nazis. So, uh, whereas America didn't have that, we've, we've been building and building and building. Uh, but it's clear that um, there is cultural variability on at least extroversion that I show you here. And we see here, for instance, countries like Brazil aren't particularly extroverted, whereas places like Nicaragua, which I was surprised to learn, um, is extremely extroverted. And so whether you, for, for whatever criticisms you might have of this kind of methodology that I've presented you with, it's clear that there is some variability. Wherever that variability comes from is a matter of debate, is a matter of research, but um, we, we, we need to move from weird samples, but it's quite difficult to do in personality psychology because of all the parameters that have now been placed on cross-cultural work with things like invariance testing and, and of course, getting people to do that work for you in other countries is, 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 a, is very labor intensive. And so you get these papers like some of two of the ones I'm on now, where we have nearly 60 co-authors. Uh, and, and when you submit a paper, I'm sure you know, that you, you're supposed to put in all the authors and all their uh, affiliations. And you know, that just takes hours just to get through that. So it's, it's, a, it's laborious. Most work on the dark triad that has looked at cross-cultural um, research at all up until really now has been um, kind of ad hoc. So, oh, I happen to know someone in Hungary, I happen to know someone in Brazil. They didn't do a, we didn't do a large enough collection of countries and we didn't target countries. It was more like, um, does the effect replicate in different countries? It was more that type of um, mentality as opposed to trying to account for differences in the dark tribe from country to country. So nevertheless, um, there has been some research, of course. I, I've done uh, a fair bit of this. Uh, um, I think maybe I've done most of the cross-cultural research on the dark triad, if I'm honest. Um, so we looked at uh, the distance from the equator in, uh, the, in, in the dark triad, and we correlated the distance from the equator with um, the traits. And this is where we measured uh, uh, the dark triad in the old way. So we measured it in the, 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 the MPI-40, the Mach-4, and the SRP-3. Nevertheless, uh, we find these patterns, that the closer you are to the equator, the more narcissistic you are, the shorter the distance. Okay? And the further you are from the equator, the more Machiavellian you are. So essentially, uh, in countries like Nigeria, Ecuador, Colombia, Costa Rica, these types of places, there seems to be uh, higher rates of narcissism. So what might this be about? This is me conjecturing here, of course. Well, around the equator, there are more diseases. And when there are more diseases, something like narcissism that encourages you to show off to display your fitness might be useful. These are the places where we find Mardi Gras, for example, um, you know, with their, their amazing headwear and, and, and all that type of stuff. In contrast, we have up at the top for Machiavellianism, we have cold places, Russia, Latvia, Lithuania, Czech Republic, and of course, very close Poland as well. And well, what might be going on here? Uh, if you watch Game of Thrones, which admittedly I have not watched, I know I'm maybe the only one of the only three people in the world who hasn't watched it. Uh, may, maybe my grandmother is the fourth person. Um, winter is coming. And when winter is coming, you need to plan ahead. And Machiavellianism, unlike the other two dark triad traits, has this long-term planning element to it. 
So these are just my conjectures. I want to show you where Poland is, um, just for your, you know, for your entertainment's sake. So on the left, we have Poland right about here. Right. And on the right, we have it right about there. So in terms of the, its placement in the graph, it's rather middle, but it suggests that Poland is probably a, a bit more Machiavellian than it is narcissistic. I don't know. Like I said, this is my fourth time here, uh, but you can judge uh, your own, your, you know, your, your country folk uh, um, on your own. But as a general rule, we've failed to integrate these contextual factors. And this is a very high level contextual factor, right? This is distance from the equator. It's not even the classic context that social psychologists think of, which would be, you know, a, a prime that you might engage in a number, or the number of people in the room or, or uh, things like that. Um, so as an evolutionary psychologist, I'm very much with these, these higher order uh, forces that might act upon us like temperature and things like that. Um, but also social forces as well. And so we start by asking the question, what accounts for cross-cultural variance in the dark triad traits? So we want to know, are the cultural factors expressions of individual traits? Is this a, as in, does it come up from the bottom? Are they bottom-up processes? Is, are narcissists, do narcissistic people, uh, when there's lots of them, do they create certain kinds of societies? Or the opposite of that would be a bottom, a top-down process, whereas uh, this is a very kind of um, victimhood kind of approach, right? Does culture impose things upon you? Are you the victim of cultural factors? Uh, um, you know, media effects researchers would, of course, take this model, uh, th th for example. We also want to look at uh, what accounts for sex differences. So we know from many studies that sex differences exist in the dark triad. This is a, a rather over, uh, almost settled uh, question. But it's probable that those sex differences vary from country to country. And then what makes them vary? So uh, are those, are they different? Uh, are, are those sex differences larger in places that are, um, have larger, uh, more patriarchal power systems? Are sex differences suppressed in more conservative places? Is potentially more danger, a more dangerous place, is this driving sex differences? So we, we, we take a rather broad view uh, here, because this is what, what I'll present here is the first cross-cultural uh, study looking at uh, country-level correlates of the dark triad. And so we collected data from around the world. Now, this looks far more impressive than it is, of course, because we didn't really get people from all the way up here, uh, the top of Canada. And, and I don't think we got anyone from Alaska, and we didn't get anyone from, you know, all the way up here. But in terms of this country map, we have this um, uh, range covered. And obviously, we have a lot from Europe, as you see here, Poland inclusive. Uh, uh, amazingly, we don't have Italy, um, but I've only been in Italy, I've only been working in Italy since like March 3rd. Um, so maybe next time we'll get Italy in there as well. But nevertheless, we have a fair um, range of countries. In here, we have something like 53 countries that we were able to sample. Uh, in the analysis, though, we, given some inclusion criteria, we, we, the analysis of our portfolio here is only for 49 countries. Uh, this, this is a paper that's under review right now at the Journal of Personality. Um, and it's a, a, it's a fairly large sample size um, by these traditional standards. These are mostly uh, college students. Um, the sample size mean was about 230. Our goal was uh, more like 250 per, uh, per site, but that was uh, quite difficult to get, especially when it were places like Africa. We had a lot of trouble, and so um, we had to loosen our inclusion criteria in some places because the, the, you know, the difficulty of getting samples in those places is quite, is quite difficult. This is a college student sample of volunteers in most places, so um, they're, they're, they're on the young side. Uh, no surprise there. We used my measure of the dark triad, and, and despite its criticisms, uh, we used it mostly because it's very short and because uh, both uh, our, our publication coming out now in assessment and, sub and prior studies show that unlike other short measures of the dark triad, our, my measure, uh, mine and Greg Webster's measure, uh, um, is more replicable cross-culturally. So the factor structure seems to replicate better with the dirty dozen than it does with what's called the short dark triad. But if you can, the short dark triad is uh, better to use because it's longer, it captures more of the personality space than mine does. And so we, the translation was done um, in a standard way. I have a website um, 
where I uh, link to the various measures. I think we have something like 23 translations of the scale already. Uh, so if you have cross-cultural collaborators who might be interested in this, uh, we can um, uh, we, we can get get their hands on this. And we find um, you know internal consistencies ranging from acceptable 0.52 to um, to uh, uh, oh the, 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 that should not say 0 0.60. Sorry, uh, to as high as 0 0.90. Um, there is a, a, a there is quite a bit of range. Uh, and where it tends to be lowest, strangely enough, was Brazil. And this is the second time I've experienced this, that Brazil seems to have low internal consistency for the dark triad. But nevertheless, um, we do find what's called congruence, which is a factor analytic way of looking at the, um, whether you can trust uh, the data from country to country. And we find, uh, we seem to have good congruence uh, between individual level and country level uh, of all the traits. Now, as I said, we're, we kind of, uh, threw a lot of things at our data here, um, but I want to point out here that the, the list is endless. And so you could essentially come up with any pet variable you had and said, well, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And the answer is, I don't know, and go for it. Uh, so in our study in the Journal of Personality, we plan to uh, publish the means for all our tests. And that means you can just, that means you can just take them and run them in any way you want. And so imagine you have a hypothesis that says that uh, warmer places should have more narcissistic people. Well, you have data from 49 countries in this article, hope when it gets published, I'll knock on wood, uh, when it gets published. And you can easily just combine the two bits of information and run the analysis. And maybe you put me as a last author, maybe. Um, okay, so there's lots of potential things we could do but we had to whittle it down and look at some stuff. And so I'm gonna to try to give you a crash course on what we, what, what we found here. Um, most of the effects were in narcissism, as you see here, uh, but the summary of this is essentially in, in harsher places, in more uh, in places, in less equal places, narcissism rates are higher, right? And so in, in this is, a, Part of my evolutionary argument, I think, that, that these are traits that help people survive in harsh contexts. But in, in terms of sex differences, we find that the sex differences seem to grow in more advanced places, right? And so in safer places, in more gender equal places, in more uh, egalitarian places, sex differences grow. The sex differences here were calculated with just Cohen's D. So we use the Cohen's D from each country and correlated with these person factors. Right? And it suggests that as societies become more advanced, sex differences actually grow. And so this is problematic to the kind of constructivist uh, social role theory model, which would suggest that, that, that uh, sex differences are strongest, are, are artifacts, sorry, are artifacts of uh, patriarchal power systems. And so as countries become more advanced, the, the sex differences should get smaller because patriarchy is dying, right? We're slowly killing it. Um, and that's not what we find. We find the opposite of that and say, well, this is, this is the case of narcissism. Uh, I can point you to other evidence that looks at things like psychopathy uh, and even physiological things like uh, heart rate um, shows the same pattern. Now in uh, Machiavellianism and psychopathy, we don't find as much going on. There is some hints that in more advanced societies, Machiavellian rates are higher, and that might simply be uh, because these are societies that are harder to negotiate, and you have to be a little bit more long-term, pragmatic, strategizing in your uh, approach to the world. Nevertheless, moving on. Um, as a rule, uh, as I mentioned, in the Grama world, sex differences are larger, uh, are, are, sorry, men are more uh, narcissistic, Machiavellian, and psychopathic. We tested this in two ways, both with a latent means approach, uh, and also with using Hedges G, which is a, um, a sample size weighted uh, effect size to take into account differences in the number of men and women in the sample. And you find moderate um, uh, sex differences here. I, I imagine if you looked at another measure of effect size, you know, the Malinovis distance, you might find uh, that, you, that, that profiles for men and women differ even more. Uh, and you find a substantial uh, difference um, in men in terms of these dark personality traits. Nevertheless, what in, in the conclusion for study one, we could say that harshness, quote unquote, seems to be associated with 
faster life strategies in the form of narcissism. But with Machiavellianism in particular, that complex societies may encourage duplicitousness. Niceness, on the other hand, seems to create larger sex differences, at least in narcissism. And this is, which I didn't mention earlier, is mostly driven by women. And it, what it appears to be is that women become much less narcissistic in these same And so women become less narcissistic in those nicer places. Men continue to be narcissistic in variant of the location, basically. Okay. So I'll skip this because I'm, I'm, I'm going too slow here. Um, sorry for talking too much. So we followed this up. We said, okay, well, we, did, well, we followed it up, but it, they came in different orders because putting together a project with 70 authors takes much longer than putting together a project with three authors. So uh, in truth, this was follow-up, but it, there, this one has already been published. Um, anyway, so we, we said, okay, we've got all these countries. Now let's target countries. Let's pick countries that we know are different based on economic indicators in particular, and let's compare them, right? So instead of doing the, this, this correlational approach, let's do t-tests, let's compare means instead. So we've got Australian students and Turkish students to take this. Australia is considered the 13th safest country in the world, where Turkey is considered the 149th. Um, a report came out, I think a year or two ago, that found that Australia is the safest country in the world for women. So there are vast differences in safety and income inequality between these two countries. So we started with these two countries. And we had uh, uh, you know, um, more women than men, no surprise there, and a, a, a typical college student sample age of 23. Now, one of the interesting things that happened when we were collecting and designing this study is that this happened in Turkey. This is, a, this is an actual event that happened uh, only a couple of years ago where people were protesting for uh, gay rights here and the police came around and they were essentially spraying water and saying disperse. And what I think is funny about this, of course, is the rainbow that the, the police essentially created um, by their efforts to, to, um, to, to be homophobic, to be uh, uh, against um, you know, um, gay people getting the right to marry. Anyways, so this is a, a, a kind of a quasi-experimental study. A natural group's design would be more accurate to say. And we used the short dark triad here because we had the space and the time and the money. We used um, two potential mechanisms that might account for those differences, that people's perceptions of the world being dangerous and people's perceptions of the world being competitive. And our goal here was to account for differences in the dark triad between the countries. And so uh, uh, this is a, a, seems kind of sad maybe to say, but Turkey is a much darker place. Uh, and I don't mean dark in terms of color, of course. I mean dark, dark triad, right? They, and these are substantial sex differences, uh, as you can see. In particular, people in Turkey really think they're living in a dangerous place, right? 0.9, negative 0.93. Um, it's not that people in Australia don't think the world is dangerous. It's just Australians have a, they have a really safe life on their little island uh, uh, relative to, to, to people and other people around the world. So anyways, there clearly is this, this darkness going on. Uh, Turkey is darker than Australia. We find sex differences for these variables here. Uh, we replicate the sex differences for the dark triad, and we also find that men see the world as more competitive. Uh, the way uh, I put it often is that men have competition-colored glasses. They see the world in terms of competition, right? Uh, but if you notice, if you can remember back just one slide, these, these, these D values are quite substantially smaller than, um, this, than, than the ones for country, and suggest that the that country differences might be far more interesting to study than sex differences that there's far more variance from country to country than there is uh, between men and women. Uh, something to think about for future research, of course. And so we looked at a, a simple ANOVA, uh, sex by country. And we find that there is this ANOVA. We find that there, the difference is uh, weaker by quite a bit in men, which is what we expect, right? The sex difference is, uh, sorry, the country difference, as you see here, is substantially larger than this one here by 0.49. Uh, but if you notice, the change is really in women again. So men tend to stay about the same, and there's no difference here between narcissism scores. 
but women in Australia are quite unnarcissistic. And now this confuses my friends in, in Australia because they're like, oh, well, Australians are you know, so narcissistic where everybody is wearing fancy dresses and putting their makeup on and everyone cares about what car you have. And having just lived there for eight and a half years, I can attest to this being the case. Uh, but what we find here is that um, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, that Turkish women seem to be more narcissistic than uh, Australian women. And again, in a nicer place, oh, the sex difference is larger. Nice being, in this case, Australia, being the nicer, safer, all that kind of stuff. Whew, I gotta hurry up. Sorry, everybody. Um, the, the dark tribe are all correlated with beliefs in the competitive world. They're all correlated with beliefs that the world is dangerous, but those correlations are larger in the competitive world space than the dangerous world space. Now, can we account for the country level differences in uh, the dark triad with competitive worldviews based on our prior research? And so we put in a, in, in a hierarchical multiple regression in step one, we put in the dark triad traits, and these are the in um, as dependent variables, and we put in as the first step, we put uh, the country. Right? And so we replicate the country effects that we already found. And then when we put in com competitiveness as the mediator, we find a shrink in all of these cases. Right? And so it's partial in both sexes, but in all cases, we find um, that it accounts for part of the variance in country differences. So, so seeing the world as competitive is a partial mediator for country level differences in the dark time. Of course, I'm interested in sex differences. And so I said, let's just look at sex differences as well and look at how they differ from country to country. So we're just flipping it around. And so now we put sex as the predictor in step one. Again, only competitive worldviews is treated as the uh, mediator. And we find, again, partial mediation. So partial mediation in Australia uh, for all three traits. We find full mediation in Turkey for psychopathy, meaning the entire relationship, the entire country level difference. And psychopathy is a function of perceptions of the world of its competitiveness, and uh, the effects were equal in uh, men and women for, for Machiavellianism and narcissism. So in general, I'd like to argue that uh, the dark triad are condition-dependent adaptations to deal with sociological conditions. I hope that's what they are. I think that's what they are. So I'm celebrating slightly, um, but clearly tremendous moral research is called for. Um, they seem to be sensitive to local conditions, narcissism in particular, but this is important because if people's responses, people's dark triad responses were invariant to social conditions, it would suggest that they're more likely to be maladaptive, right? They don't, they don't take in information from the world and then moderate their behavior. Uh, that would be a fixed alternative social strategy, which is what some people have argued uh, these traits are. I'm arguing that they're condition dependent. Um, each trait might be sensitive to particular inputs, as previous re research has already shown, but these biases, I think, enable people to be successful when time gets tough. And so one argument about the narcissism effect in the poorer places is that in this narcissism for women acts as an insurance policy for when women are able to get uh, what they need from, from men, potentially, that they have to be more uh, uh, um, engaged with the world, flirtatious with other men, uh, and, and uh, narcissistic. Uh, study one, of course, was the first large-scale assessment of the dark triad in the world. No, no one's ever taken this level of, of, of um, uh, data to, to, to understand the, the country-level patterns of how the world is shrouded in darkness. Um, um, Machiavellianism and psychopathy seem to be a little bit less sensitive, but they seem to be consistent with American politics uh, in that in more advanced societies, you know, Americans are always saying we're the you know, most advanced place in the world. And obviously, they're you know, probably full of shit, but um, there seems to be something about Machiavellianism and psychopathy being stronger in more advanced uh, countries. Um, but we didn't find statistical significance for those because we only have 49 countries. And so our tests are essentially underpowered, but the correlations for Machiavellianism were in the low 0.20s. And so in a typical social psychology study, that's what you would expect to find. So we don't have little stars next to them because of the number of participants. Study two was the targeted sample uh, looking at uh, Australia and, 
and Turkey was darker than Australia, and Turkish people saw the world as both most more dangerous and more competitive. Um, men were higher on the dark triad traits, and they saw the world as more competitive. And it seems like, again, narcissism rates seem to be lower in, uh, uh, in women in safer places, whereas men seem to consistently uh, be narcissistic. So obviously some limitations. We have student and volunteer samples all around. We have some sample size issues I mentioned already for step, study one. All of this is cross-sectional. It's not even longitudinal. Um, uh, we, we fail to look at aspects. So to use uh, Anya's, for example, um, we, don't, we don't look at uh, grandiose and vulnerable narcissism in this. We, we simply can't get at that level of depth with the the kind of with the engagement of this survey, this was a, a pretty vast survey that people had to take, um, and we couldn't get that level of precision. So it wasn't a dark triad only project, and so we couldn't just look at the dark triad. We used natural groups design in study two, which looks nice, uh, but it is um, it, it, it it's subject to the choice in countries that we had, and we think we can we justify those choices well. But uh, somebody could say, well, what about this country, and what about that country? There's, of course, the problem of the ever-expanding list of dark traits. So, of course, the dark triad has blended itself now maybe into the dark tetrad. Um, and, and if you add spitefulness, you might make it the pentad. And it could just keep going ad nauseum. I have, I, we can talk, if you have questions about this issue, I can tell you why I don't think it's necessary to expand past the three. Um, but nevertheless, people will say, well, what about sadism? It's always a possibility. So in conclusion, the dark triad traits are sensitive to environmental variants. They are, seem to be societal conditions and values that are linked to the dark triad. This was in the case of uh, narcissism in particular, um, is what seemed to matter. And in most places, um, men are higher in the dark triad than women are. And when they aren't, the sex difference doesn't reverse. Uh, I think there was the only cases in the data where the, the effect size reversed were non-significant differences where it was like, you know, an effect size of, 0 0.01 or something, really tiny kind of uh, difference. And these were in bizarre, some strange places that might have had low, sa low sample size, like to Togo, for example, uh, was one of our low samples. Um, in short, I'd like to say that I think when times get tough, people may be nudged to adopt dark behavioral syndrome, the dark trait, dark triad, for instance, to get what they want from the world. Thanks. <laughs>